I want to thank you for joining us on this legacy project. You know, to be honest, it's just so good to be able to study the scriptures together, to take some time, be relaxed and follow through all this wonderful material that we're sharing, laying out. And, uh, you know, the depth of the word of God is so valuable and so important that we take time to study, take time to learn, take time to grow. And so thanks for joining us on this legacy project. I want you to get your Bible, get your notebook, get ready. You can hit pause anytime and look up the scriptures, check it out. And so let's click that button and get underway. Welcome to the Legacy Project. You know, today we're going to be talking a very, very interesting subject. And we're going to be speaking out of the book of Leviticus. Now, I know as soon as I said Leviticus, some of you already probably switched off the button, but hang in there. You know, if we don't understand types and shadows, if we don't understand what God was talking to us today about, then I know Leviticus and some of the other books can be pretty dry reading and they can be pretty hard going, you know. But the interesting thing in Leviticus chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4 and chapter 5, it lays out the five offerings. And you might say, well, what has that got to do with me today? Well, one for each chapter, and I want you to think about this. Romans 15 verse 4 says, whatever things, whatever things were written before, talking about the Old Testament, were written for our learning, for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so basically what the New Testament is saying that all these things that were written are written for us, that we can learn from them, we can glean from them, we can understand them. And 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says all these things happened to them, talking about again the Old Testament as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so really, to be honest, you know, we're talking about you and I living in the age today, end of the time, that these things, even these five offerings of Leviticus, are important to us today. And so we're going to be looking at them. But first, can I just say, we need to understand that the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. Jesus said, did not Moses speak of me? Now, of course, Moses did not say the word Jesus. He said the word Joshua, which is very similar, but he didn't talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, but he did in types and shadows. And uh, John says, Christ was in all things, made all things, came into, nothing came into existence without him, right? And so we need to study the book of Leviticus and particularly these five offerings and understand what it means to us today in our New Testament Christian walk. And so whether it's a tabernacle, whether it's the three feasts, we know about them, Passover, Pentecost and tabernacles. And uh, you know, the Sabbath, what does it mean to us today? Circumcision, what does it mean to us today? Well, of course, first in the natural, then in the spiritual. Aren't you happy about that? You know, we get circumcised of heart, but the, the reality is still there uh, in types and shadows in the Old Testament to the New. And so Christ is all in all. And so, for example, the scriptures clearly tell us that the rock, the rock that followed the Israelites through the Old Testament, through the wilderness producing water to keep them alive, the New Testament says the rock was Christ. In 1 Corinthians, it simply puts in 1 Corinthians 10.4 that that rock was Christ. The manna that came down from heaven. Of course, Christ is the bread of life. Jesus spoke about it, how the Father gave them the bread from heaven. And so we know also, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, the Passover lamb. We've talked about this in other sessions, and I hope and pray that you get your head around this, but the, all the Old Testament points to Jesus. It all revolves around Him. And so for every Old Testament offering of these five offerings in Leviticus of the first five chapters, there's a New Testament counterpart. The Old Testament's got the substance, and in the New Testament, there's a type and shadow. And so we'll be looking at this uh, in this session, and we'll be talking about this. And so in Leviticus, we see, number one, and I want you to make a note of it, that Jesus Christ became all five offerings at Calvary. All five offerings. It's amazing. Not only do we have a part to play in this, but Jesus has a part to play. He paid the full price for our redemption. Amen? He paid the full price for our redemption, uh, not for our maturity. We've got to work out that daily. You know, He gives us our salvation, but what we do with it, the Bible says to work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. So there's areas of our lives that we need to work on. And we'll be looking at these five offerings and how they apply to us today in relation to grow into the likeness of Christ. But we'll also see how Jesus became all these five offerings as well. So before we 
uh, we, we, sorry, when, when we can learn from these five offerings, we'll know, number one, that Jesus Christ became all five offerings at Calvary. We'll also know what is the full price to pay in order to become a mature son of God. In other words, to grow into light, into wholeness and to unity. And, uh, you know, to think about, I want you to think about this, to become a hundredfold Christian. We can either bear fruit, 30, 60 or 100. You know, God's heart is that we'd be fruitful and we would multiply. So let's come to unity and maturity and wholeness. Amen. And so Jesus, yes, he became all five offerings, but we also have got a part to play. And so these five offerings are keys to maturity. Just like the seven churches, when we read about the seven churches, it's to he who overcomes its promised all the wonderful promises in the book of Revelation, right? So the Bible is full of references, as you know, to sacrifice and to offerings. It goes way back to Cain and Abel. But even further than that, it goes back to Genesis chapter 3, where God himself, he slew an animal. He shed innocent blood to cover Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, when Adam and Eve sinned, when Adam and Eve separated themselves from God in the garden and fell into sin, you know, the thing was God came along and shed the first innocent blood of an animal to cover, to clothe Adam and Eve. You know, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Why? Because life is in the blood. Genesis 4, we know Cain and Abel, as I mentioned before, they brought an offering to the Lord. And I'm sure you're familiar with the story, but Cain, he brought the wrong type of offering. He needed to bring a sin offering. He needed to bring a bloodshed offering uh, to cover a sin, but he brought a, f a fruit offering of the ground. In other words, it was a thank offering. And you've got to know what is the right offering to bring at the right time. Well, let me just put it quite simply. Say, if someone went out and robbed a bank or committed adultery or something, it's not much good coming to church the next day with $100 or $1,000 or $5,000 as an offering without first coming in repentance, right? You, you got to learn uh, what is the right type of offering. Of course, the blood of Christ is the right type of offering to cover that sin. And you can't buy your way, you can't earn your way in relation to that. So when one thing is required, it's pointless, pointless to bring the wrong type of offering. And so God doesn't want your money. Uh, he wants your, your repentance. Obviously, once you've given your life to Christ, then, then sure, you bring your tithes and offerings and so forth, but you can't buy your way to heaven. It needs the blood of the Lamb for your salvation. Amen. And so God today first requires the blood of Jesus in our life before any works. And the Bible talks about uh, us working unto the Lord, co-laboring with the Lord, good works and so forth. Uh, God wants us to cover our lives with the blood of Jesus before we do anything any good works before we uh, bring any money or any other offering that you may, your time, energy, and finance, right? So you've got to have the right offering at the right time. And that way, it produces blessing. The wrong offering at the wrong time is a waste. That's exactly what happened to Cain, of course. And so Paul says in Corinthians, listen to this, if I offer my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So you can offer your whole body and, uh, you know, to be burnt. But if you have not love, it profits you nothing. What a waste it would be. And so very important, straight up, the right offering at the right time, the right voice and the right door. You've got to know what is the right thing to do. And that hence we are looking at this book of Leviticus and what it means to us today in the year in which we live. So as you know, in the Old Testament, there were daily offerings, there were yearly offerings, there were uh, three major feasts, there were sacrifices. We know all about Moses' tabernacle, the Temple of Solomon, the Feast of Israel, David's tabernacle. We've talked about that for that short period of time. But sacrifices were made throughout Scripture. Noah, after the flood, you know and I know, he offered sacrifices unto God. Abraham did, Isaac did, Jacob did, Moses did, Joshua did, Gideon did. You know, it goes on, Elijah and Elisha and so forth. Blood sacrifices were sealed with each covenant. There are five major covenants in the Old Testament. The Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. I praise God for the new covenant. Amen. But listen, 
in that covenant, the new covenant, you know and I know that blood was shed also. And so today we're looking at these five major Levitical offerings. Sure, there are other uh, minor offerings, just like there are other minor feasts, apart from the three major feasts, Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. There were other occasions and other feasts. Uh, and there were other times, but, and likewise, there are other offerings. But these are the five major offerings, all right. And they were all sacrifices. They were either animal or vegetable. You ever play that game as a kid, animal or vegetable? But it's interesting that, listen, salt had to be imparted on both animal and vegetable offerings. Salt. You might say, what's that got to do with me today? Salt. Well, first of all, of course, salt's great on pork or salt's great on meat. And, uh, you know, lettuce even tastes better with salt on it, right? But in the New Testament, salt signifies graciousness. In other words, love. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. Now, I want you to think about that. Here's the Apostle Paul writing Colossians, and he knows the Old Testament. So he knew the significance of salt. He knew the typology of what it would mean for us today, not to take salt out of a salt shaker and put it, you know, on our tongue, on our speech. No, imagine a mouthful of salt. Yuck. Um, but he said, let your speech also be with grace, 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 seasoned as it were with salt. So we don't respond with our tongue harshly, angrily. We don't swear and curse, right? We have grace on our speech, on our tongue, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. Because the Apostle Paul knows that's exactly what some people do. They respond wrongly when somebody upsets them. They respond angrily or, or mean or say words that they wish they hadn't. Amazing how you can't take back in words, right? Now, all the priests had to know how to make a sacrifice and to offer an offering. It was their job, it was their duty, it was their responsibility. Every priest had to know how to do it. And isn't it true in the New Testament, the Bible says we are all priests, hallelujah. All believers are priests, we're all saints, isn't that good, saints. You don't have to wait for a church to give you a sainthood, you are a saint and you're a priest. And so it's worth knowing our responsibility. In the Old Testament, they had to know how to make an offering, how, what to offer. It was their responsibility and it's our responsibility today to grow as Christians and know what, what offering we need to offer up at what time and to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Did you just hear what I said? Spiritual sacrifices. God says in his book that his people perish because lack of knowledge. I don't wanna have that lack of knowledge. I want to know what God wants me to know. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a, into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that again. This is very important. You also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. I mentioned before, you're a priest. To offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So first in the natural, then in the spiritual. So going back to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter one, two, three, four, and five, it lays it out. Number one was a burnt offering. Number two was a grain, the meal offering. Number three, the peace offering. Number four, the sin offering. And number five, the trespass offering. Now, please hear this. This is very important. Very important to note that the first three offerings were voluntary. In other words, people could or couldn't or didn't have to do it. They were voluntary. If people wanted to, they could. If they felt the need to, they could. But if they didn't want to, they had to. The last two offerings were compulsory. The last two offerings were compulsory. And we have the same pattern in the New Testament. For the five spiritual offerings in the New Testament, we have three voluntary and two compulsory. Now you're, I know you're sitting there saying, hang on, uh, Jesus, you know, his blood covers them all and that's it. But I, I want you to stay with me now. 
We know that applying the blood of Jesus is essential for salvation. We know that. Uh, praise God. He's a Passover lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. It's his name and his name only, right? And it's compulsory to have the blood of Christ over our heart, over our lives, over the doorposts and the lintels of our lives uh, to enter heaven. Jesus said, you must be born again. We all agree with that. But I want you to write this down, that salvation is the sin offering. So what's the other compulsory offering? What is the other? Glad you asked. <laughs> uh, because once you're saved, what about sanctification? Sanctification, it's a big word, isn't it? Sanctification is the separation from sin. The separation from sin. See, this was also essential and compulsory for one to enter heaven. I'll be talking about it. See, it's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to stay saved. You know, uh, people have doctrines, you know, once saved, always saved, or if you got saved and you backstood, then you weren't really saved. No, I believe, you know, you give your life to Christ, you're saved. You were working out our salvation daily with fear and trembling. And there's also the salvation yet to be revealed. The Bible says without reference to sin. And so sanctification is one thing to be saved, another thing to stay saved. And so Philippians 2.12, to work out your salvation daily. And then it goes on, and not trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. Amazing, isn't it? How somebody can give their life to Christ, then go out and just continue in sin. And you're trampling under the blood of Christ. So in sanctification, the separation of sin, a must. Or can we just get saved and then stay and live in sin? Well, as we go through these Levitical five offerings and talk about them in the New Testament, we will see. Because sanctification is a trespass offering. I mentioned before, salvation is the sin offering. Remember the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Salvation is a sin offering, but sanctification is a trespass offering. Trespass means to cut against or to cut across. You know, trespassers will be prosecuted, right? To cut across. And so often we can cut across God and we can cut across other people. We'll talk about it. Each of these five offerings were for a specific purpose or a specific problem. And it's the same in the New Testament. So let's go through these five offerings, starting first with the three voluntary offerings, right? The first offering, the burnt offering, is found in Leviticus chapter 1. And uh, it's also found in Leviticus 6, by the way, verse 8 to 13. But Leviticus 1, verse 1. Now the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock of the herd and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. So we're involved in it. And it shall be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar and by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So this was called the burnt offering. Why? Because fire was burning on that altar all night and all morning. And the other reason it was called a burnt offering is that it all had to be consumed. There was to be nothing left over. It was all to be sacrificed, right? And so in the New Testament, the counterpart of this offering, the sacrifice, as I mentioned, there is five in the Old Testament and there's also five offerings in the New Testament. Let me read this offering in the New Testament, the counterpart of this burnt offering. Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, talking to you right now, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, isn't it amazing how Jesus came to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire? the fire of God. Think about the fire that came down with Elijah and consumed the sacrifice. The Holy Spirit burns both on us and in us 24 seven, right? It never goes out. The fire of the Holy Spirit should never ever go out. It's not just on Sundays, hallelujah. And also it's both outward and inward, everything. I mean, our bodies are to be a living sacrifice. The Holy Spirit comes upon us and dwells within us inwardly. You know, when you think about the way somebody behaves, when you think about the way we think, 
when you think about the way we speak or the attitudes we have. In other words, our character and the fruit of the Spirit flows through us and flows out of us. So our bodies are a living sacrifice, outwardly as well. When you think about inwardly, as I said, the way we behave, our speech, what flows out and so forth, but the way one looks, the way one dresses. I mean, I don't want to talk too much about that today, but the way some people dress, you've got to ask yourself, is that dressed in a Christ-like manner? Uh, modesty is not a trendy word today, but it is a biblical word. It is a biblical word. And Philippians 4 verse 5 says, Let your moderation be known to all men. Let your moderation be known to all men. And Romans 12 verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. So just because something is trendy in this world, just because that's, that's how it's done in this world, you know, and I know, that you know, it's a struggle just to go to the beach today. Uh, and just because it's trendy doesn't mean to say it's right, right? And so do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the Word of God, by the Word of God. And I'm just not talking about girls dress here, boys as well. And, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 6 says that we can sin against our own body. We can sin against our own body. Why? Because our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And it goes on to say, listen, it goes on to say that we are not our own. Our bodies are not our own, that we've been bought with a price. Therefore, the scripture says, are you listening? Therefore, glorify God in your body. Wow, wow. Glorify God in your body. So you've got to ask yourself, you know, the way you look, the way you dress, what you say, where you go, so forth. Are we glorifying God in our body? So we need to dress, we need to act, we need to speak like Christians. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I buffet my body, I pummel my body and make it my slave for the gospel's sake. So there's some things we do for the gospel's sake. We may not even, uh, you know, want to do it, but we do it for the gospel's sake. You know, I used to wear a tie preaching. I wore it for the gospel's sake. I don't wear a tie now. That's not, neither going to break or make. But, you know, there are things that I do today that's for the gospel's sake. And so the burnt offering was a voluntary offering. I didn't have to. And, uh, you know, the, you don't have to do anything. You can do what you like. But the thing is, is that, you know, this is important. If we really want to be a hundredfold Christian, then we understand that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not our own. And we need to bring it as an offering. You know, I present my body as a living sacrifice. It's living, praise the Lord, it's not dead. And so this burnt offering, a voluntary offering, Leviticus 1 verse 3, nobody is made to conform to his word, right? Nobody is made to conform. You know, it's not a matter of rules and regulations. And this is where often we go wrong because then we make rules for people and regulations for people. And that's when religion comes in, right? And so let's be honest, there's a big difference between compulsory and voluntary. It's called legalism. And uh, you can either have legalism or love. And we want to be on the side of love and mercy. Love is you do right because you, not because you have to, but because you want to. Did you just hear what I said? Love, you do what is right, not because you have to, but because you want to. Even things like coming to a prayer meeting, sometimes you may not want to, but you do because you love the Lord. Community days, all these things, right? Sacrificing our time and our energy. Now, it wasn't compulsory. Uh, you, you'll go to heaven, um, you know, if I... I, I could say, you know, you go to heaven wearing a G-string. I could say, whatever, I don't know. I don't want to be too stupid about it. But you know what I'm talking about. You know, so the thing is, is that you still go to heaven. But if there's a desire to please the Lord, to see his kingdom come, to help build the church, then you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And sometimes, uh, you know, it, it's just a lot easier to stay home and watch TV. But we're not called to do that. We're called to be out there, right? We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, hello, but not all things are profitable. So offering, sacrificing, sacrificing our time and our energy. You know, it's, as I mentioned, it's not compulsory. This offering wasn't compulsory. It was a free will offering. But I, I, I have to tell you that your treasure uh, could be a little thin up there if you don't apply these offerings to your life. I want to help you be an overcomer. I want you to be a hundredfold believer. 
And so there are three types of burnt offerings. As we bring this uh, session number one of the five offerings to a close, let's just follow through three types of, of burnt offerings in Leviticus. There is a bullock. You could bring a bullock, which was strong, powerful, and costly, by the way, or a sheep and a goat, which was pretty ordinary, plain, and average. Or you could even bring a per pigeon or a dove, which was like wheat and didn't cost that much. And so basically it's up to you what you brought. Can I just say God accepts the strong and the weak, the rich and the poor, and we can all offer our bodies, whatever we got to. I know some people have got more to offer in the sense they may have be really good looking, you know, and really want to, you know, flaunt it. I don't know. Or maybe they got brains, a lot of brains, you know. Maybe they got muscles, you know, and, and want to, you know, show everybody their six pack. I don't know. But the thing is, is that, you know, others don't have that. I don't want to show you my six pack. You can't see it. It's hidden. So the thing is, is that, you know, but whether you're rich or poor, strong or weak, God, 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 God will accept that, right? Whether you've got a lot to offer or not a lot to offer. We all offer our bodies, whether we're strong or weak, whether we're healthy or whether we're crippled. It doesn't matter. God says, give me what you got. And I want you to note that the offering was to be unblemished. In other words, it had to be his best calf, his pure pedigree. So whatever you offer to God, offer your best to God. Don't do it half-hearted. He deserves better than just our leftovers. And the sacrifice, by the way, had to be thoroughly examined inside and out. And so when we bring a sacrifice, we can't have hidden motives. We can't do it half-hearted with agendas, you know, doing this out of, you know, well, gritting our teeth and so forth. It's got to be an action of dedication. It's not just an outward show. We've got to have a sincere and genu genuine consecration of our sacrifice. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6 says, Be a servant of God in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in genuine love. So our thoughts, our motives, our ambitions must be right. Total dedication, nothing left over, right? And so this burnt offering, offering ourselves, uh, the, the New Testament counterpart to Leviticus chapter one is offering ourselves on a daily basis to the Lord and to his service, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. So we're closing out the segment chapter one on the five offerings and we've still got four to go. So I hope and pray that you will join us on those. Thanks for listening.